Oh, <laughs> excuse me, I'm just praising to our Lord and Savior, the Legend of Zelda series. Let me tell you, I'm a huge Zelda fan. I've played all of them. Uh, you got Link to the Past, Ocarina of Time, you know, the best one. I even played the lesser known games, like the Oracle games and the two DS games no one remembers. Hell, I even played the NES originals. Oh. Ah, Nintendo, the company we hate to love, but love to hate. It seems like every time they take one step forward, they like to take like four steps back. Oh, Nintendo 64 games on Switch? Nice. Nintendo, I can't see how you can mess this up any more than it is. I stand corrected. But no matter how messy Nintendo can get, it's no doubt that it's one of the biggest video game companies out there. With iconic franchises like Mario and Pokemon to even smaller series like Kirby or Pikmin, it's kind of hard to imagine a world where Nintendo never created these games. A lot more richer, that's for sure. But one of the franchises that I and so many others hold dear to their heart is, of course, the Legend of Zelda series. Coming out shortly after the hit that was Super Mario Bros. on the NES, The Legend of Zelda revolutionized the adventure genre as a whole and continued doing so for nearly each big installment after the original. The series is well known for its iconic locations and music, and of course that nice blend of exploring unmarked areas with some neat puzzle solving. And we can't forget it's also well known for constantly being on everyone's best games ever made list, with choices like A Link to the Past, Ocarina of Time, to even the newest game, Breath of the Wild. And as most of us know, last year marked the 35th anniversary for this series, so I thought it would be best to play through each game in order and see how the series has evolved over the years. And let me tell you, it has evolved drastically, going from, wow, what a view, to wow, what a view. Some will be revisiting old friends, while others will be completely new experiences, but before we get to the more well-known titles, I think it'd be best to start off simple and talk about the first two NES games, starting with The Legend of Zelda and Zelda II The Adventure of Link. Let's roll back to 1986, where over in Japan, a new game was being worked on that countered the recent release of Super Mario Bros. Instead of a linear point A to B game that was Mario, Nintendo was making a more open, non-linear adventure game that gave the player freedom for whatever they wanted to do. This game was soon to be known as, you guessed it, The Legend of Zelda, and little did Nintendo know that this game would become an influential addition to gaming as a whole. Inspired by the explorations of Miyamoto around his hometown Kyoto, Zelda focused on exploring unmapped locations and finding all the secrets that the area had to offer. It could range from a simple push of a block to a good way to spend two hours of your life trying to find a bombable wall. But according to the developers, that was a key element to the game, forcing the player to not only communicate with the people within the game, but with other players as well, hence the name of the hero, Link. Now if you were the only one with a game in your area, well you better get to drawing! This game was notorious for being one confusing son of a bitch. The only thing the developers gifted you was a physical map that showed some overworld secrets and some unmarked areas. But even with this extra help, the game still gave no Fs on telling you what to do, giving only slight hints and cryptic dialogue. This factor is one of the biggest reasons that turns off so many people from completing this game, myself included, until last year. I ended up using a fan-made guide, which is something I usually don't like to do, but with a game like this, it's almost a necessity to do so. The guide I ended up using was created by Phil Summers, and is one of the most impressive handmade guides out there. It honestly feels like you're going through a previous player's journal with little quick notes how to defeat certain enemies to the gorgeous drawings and art pieces throughout the book. Sadly though, Phil Summers recently had to discontinue his future guides due to legal reasons, because, you know, Nintendo is the company that we hate to love, but love to hate. But it does seem like he's taking it pretty well and saying that exciting opportunities are popping up, so that's really good to hear. And I'm not lying when I say this guide helped me a ton throughout this playthrough, and I don't know if I would have had the patience to finish it if I didn't have it on my side. But that's enough blabbering about how I'm a patient little loser. We got a game to play. The Legend of Zelda starts off with a quick summary of the game's plot, where Ganon, who stole the Triforce of Power, seeks after the other piece, the Triforce of Wisdom. But before he could get his hands on it, Princess Zelda was like, uh-uh, bitch, I don't like triangles, and broke the Triforce of Wisdom into eight triangle-shaped pieces before she was shortly kidnapped. 
Now it's up to our hero Link, or in this case, Lemmy, to collect all eight pieces of the Triforce and save the princess from the clutches of Ganon. Fun fact, the Triforce was originally going to be microchips and the game was supposed to have a futuristic type setting. It really makes you wonder how the Zelda series would be today if it stuck with that idea. Either way, it's a basic plot, but for an NES game back in 1987, this is all you needed to start your own adventure. And what does the game do once you make your file and start the game? What the hell is this? Yep, that's right. No tutorial, no direction. Everything is up to you now. Here you can go almost anywhere on the map and start just about any dungeon you so desire. Keyword though, start, because there is a dungeon order you should follow so you won't get lost. That won't stop me though, because nobody tells me what to do. Yeah, I, I just don't know why I keep on dying. There's a sword? The game is mainly split into two locations, the overworld and the underworld. The overworld is basically an open world-esque area where you find hidden shops and hints that will help you throughout your adventure. You can also find little games to play, like gambling your money and going flat broke. Yep, I know that feeling. But it's also the place where you find entrances to the underworld, aka dungeons. The dungeons in this game play out much differently than its future counterparts. I mean, some aspects are still there, maps, compasses, key items, bosses, etc. But it's more like a combat maze where you'll mainly be fighting enemies and trying to figure out where to go next. There's not many puzzles in the game either. Pushing blocks at certain time is really as complex as it gets. Each dungeon though does feel pretty rewarding in its own way and it's pretty cool to find little secrets and hints deeper in the dungeons if you choose to explore that is. And that dungeon music, it never gets old. Never. But once you get to the end of the dungeon, that's where the real fun starts. Welcome to the original Zelda bosses, where they can range from being a walk in the park to... See, I wouldn't have much of a problem with it if I could just try again right after dying. But no, if you die, you gotta do the whole dungeon again. Now, to be fair, you don't have to worry about redoing puzzles and locked doors that needed keys, but all the enemies are back. And it's not like I can rush past them, because most of the time in Zelda 1, you have to kill every enemy in the room to even unlock the next room. So, the biggest challenge is try to get to that boss through multiple enemy-filled rooms without losing too many hearts, just to see how much damage you can do to that boss in that one run, just to die again and restart the cycle once more. Then again, we are talking about a 35-year-old NES game here, so things are going to be rough no matter what. The one boss I had the most trouble with was Gleok because of the previously mentioned statement, and it does suck that you have to repeat three variations of the same boss, but I get it, NES times were very limiting. So, a few hours later, and eight dungeons down, we finally have all eight pieces of the Triforce together. Now it's time to go on our final trek to Ganon's Lair, of course after collecting all the necessary upgrades like the Blue Ring and the Magical Sword. And now we're at the final dungeon, which is shaped like a terrifying skull and is a big and confusing beast. Repeating bosses, dead ends, and annoying enemy placements all come together to make this a very annoying experience. Of course, I did have the guide to help me go through the rooms I needed to go through, but if I didn't have it, this dungeon would have probably been the end of me. But after a tough maze of rooms, we finally encounter the beast face to face. Luckily, I know he has a fear of shapes, so I pull out my giant ass triangle and the battle starts. The fight is fierce, but with enough courage and common sense, I destroy the beast and grab yet an... Yet another giant ass triangle? Uh, j just like that, Zelda is saved now though. All thanks to geometry. And what's this? I can start a second quest that's much harder than the first? <laughs> no thanks. And that is the synopsis of the first Legend of Zelda. While the game mainly consists of you going around aimlessly hoping to find anything worth of value while also dying like a shit ton, there's also a nice old school charm about it. Is it outdated? For sure, but with the right guide and just enough patience, the game can be a solid adventure. Of course, nothing compared to some of the games now these days, but it's a great game to kickstart the series with, and it can only go up from here. Only up! Actually, I like this game a bit better. Shortly after the success of the first game, Miyamoto immediately decided to make a sequel, but this time getting together a new team and making it drastically different from his predecessor. Instead of a top-down open-world adventure that focused more on exploration than anything else, the sequel became a more side-scrolling combat-focused action game that included way more unfamiliar elements like experience points and lives. 
This reason and the infamous difficulty of the game is the main point why people call this game the black sheep of the series, and is often considered one of the worst in Zelda history. Hell, even Miyamoto was a bit disappointed with the game and wished that he could have done more with it. And I'm here to see if that point still stands, and if you saw the joke I did about 40 seconds ago, then you kinda already know my stance about it. It's good. First of all, the story in this game is a bit better than the first, having you go through six palaces to unlock the Great Palace to obtain the Hidden Triforce of Courage. The main reason you want to do this is to awaken Zelda from a sleep curse that was casted on by her brother, because... family issues? It's also a pretty neat fact that Ganon isn't in this game, but his minions are, because they want to use the blood of Link to spread on Ganon's ashes to bring him back to life, hence this game over screen. Zelda 2, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be the most adventuresome quest yet. I swear I didn't make that up. The game starts right in the temple Zelda is sleeping in. A little creepy, but once we make our way out... Oh shit, now it's like Zelda 1! I can walk in four directions, accidentally walk into these black creatures, die... Zelda 2, ladies and gentlemen. Here we can see how the rest of the game is going to go. You walk around in the overworld, encountering enemies and gaining XP, until you eventually reach one of three things. One, a roadblock where you're forced to go back. Two, a village with NPCs that will help you very, very vaguely. Or three, a palace where you're faced the hardest challenges yet. Or option number four, death. This cycle of going around and constantly trying to figure out what to do next sounds like it would get boring. It does, but the game does a pretty good job to at least help you get your foot in the right direction, unlike Zelda 1, where it was just you, a lonely boy, in South Detroit, on a midnight train going anywhere. But don't get me wrong, some clues and solutions make absolutely no sense in this game, and some can even be found in the game itself, instead of being locked behind an issue of Nintendo Power at the time. But that's common with these NES games, and like before, I did have to rely on a guide a few times throughout this playthrough. But can you blame me? In order to find this lady's missing mirror, you have to go to a random normal looking house and crouch near this table and press the attack button, just so you can magically find this mirror. There is no hints whatsoever on telling you the location of this item, even more so telling you that you can search under tables by crouching and pressing the attack button. But I am getting a little ahead of myself, why don't we discuss the main drive of this game? Combat. I'm gonna be honest here, this is probably some of the best combat in any 2D Zelda game. Now it is the only game to mainly be a side-scroller, so that may be a big factor in my opinion, but the combat is basically the saying, easy to learn, hard to master. For example, when I started this game, I had the hardest time with Dark Nuts. Their attack patterns are so quick and random that I had a hard time dealing damage to them. It was only until I learned a neat little trick that you can pull this maneuver and guarantee a hit each and every time. This, on top of the other moves you can learn, like the up thrust and the down thrust, makes it a satisfying combat system and really is the funnest part of the game for me. Now the enemies, on the other hand, can be hit or miss. At first, they have easy and readable patterns, making them a puzzle in themselves to defeat them. But later on in the game, they start throwing in some random ass enemies with wild attack patterns, and usually, I found myself trying to avoid these enemies late game since it was mainly an unfair match for me. But once again, let's all say it together now, that's, That's what, what makes an NES game an NES game. Good job, good job. Now get the hell out of my room. But let's go ahead and talk about the game's biggest fault. The damn life system. So let me do some explaining real quick. This game uses XP, unlike other titles in the franchise. XP is used to upgrade your health, attack, and magic for certain spells you can cast. You gain said XP by killing either enemies or gaining them in these pee bags. Gross. In order to upgrade one of your stats, you have to reach a certain number and it gradually gets bigger and bigger the more you level up. The biggest problem with this though is if you lose all your lives, you lose all of that current experience you just built up on that turn, forcing you to grind to get back to where you were. Now you can say, why don't you just collect lives and stack them so you won't encounter that issue? Well the problem with that is that there's only a few collectible lives in the game, and once you lose them, you can't recollect them, so you better save them for that final boss fight or it's back to square one for you. That's also another annoyance when you lose all your lives. Instead of starting over at the beginning of the palace, you start all the way back at the creepy Zelda sleeping temple. So, if the palace you was working on was, let's say, mm, the other side of the map, you have to track your way all the way back there, hoping to take the least amount of damage possible just to see if you can get the dungeon another go. That was my Zelda 2 rant. Thanks for listening.
So to solve this issue, I just grinded at the third palace until I maxed out all my stats and made the next three dungeons a cakewalk. You can call me being a pussy, but I prefer calling it. But once you make your way through the challenging six palaces, you get to face the final dungeon, the Great Palace, the hardest challenge yet. Here's where the game will throw those random enemies at you and challenge you with some tough obstacles in this excuse of a maze, until you reach the Thunderbird. A tough final boss, but one I proudly defeated without using any save states. Now time to collect the Triforce of Courage and be on my way. I got an idea. Now, you can call me being a pussy, but I prefer calling it... Damn. Zelda 2, the venturesome quest that was pretty fun, not gonna lie. This game gets a bunch of flack for being so different and challenging for newer players, but I really did enjoy my time with this game, even more so than the original. I don't know if it was the combat or the more linear approach, but the game was a blast to go through and I wouldn't mind revisiting again sometime down the road. But for now, it can be added to the completed pile. These two games define the NES era and their classics all the way through. A bit dated, yes, but with loosely following a guide and going at your own pace, they can be a great way to spend a couple hours. And if the NES isn't your thing, you can always try them out on the Zelda Collector's Edition on the GameCube, or the Virtual Console, or the re-release Game Boy Advance Sports, or the NES Classic, or the Nintendo Switch Online Service, or the Game & Watch thing. You know what? You get the idea. But this is only just the beginning. Next, we take a look into the next Zelda game, which went back to the roots of the original, but added so many elements that it made it one of the greatest games to many people. But until then, I gotta make some money.